Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, once again we approach your awesome and majestic throne. Not coming in our own merit, but coming boldly to the throne of grace through the merits of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we know that our prayer is being heard at this moment because the merits of Jesus are purifying our prayer and making it acceptable in your sight. And Father, at this moment, we plead for your presence. We ask that through the Holy Spirit and the ministration of the angels, you will open our minds that we might be able to understand the great things about the two covenants. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible describes two primary laws. And as we begin our study, we want to notice what these two primary laws are according to Scripture. The first of these laws is God's moral law, which distinguishes good from evil. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 2 and verses 15 through 17. Here we find a moral command by God. It says there, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, notice, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, as we've studied in previous lectures, actually within this one command were contained all of the principles of the Ten Commandments. I'm not going to go over that again because we've already covered it, but within this one command are all of the principles of the Ten Commandments. This is God's moral command. To eat from the tree is evil, and to not eat from the tree is good. In other words, God lays down the ground rules of what is good and what is evil. And he expected obedience from Adam and Eve. Basically, God was saying the following. If you disobey my command, that will be sin. And the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death. So what I want you to notice is that God's moral law existed before sin, before Adam and Eve sinned. And the purpose of the moral law was to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil. Of course, we know that Adam and Eve sinned. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God instituted another law. It's known as the ceremonial law or the law of ordinances and sacrifices. The ceremonial law comes in after sin. It's not part of God's original plan. The moral law existed before sin. The ceremonial law comes in because of sin. Now notice Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, which we've studied before. Genesis 3 and verse 21. Here we're told that when Adam and Eve sinned, a sacrifice took place the day that they sinned. It says there, also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of what? Of skin and clothed them. How was the shame of their nakedness covered? It was covered by skins provided by what? by the lamb. Now what do you need to do to get the skin of an animal? The animal has to be slain. And so basically God was showing from the very beginning of human history that the way in which he was going to cover the shame of man's nakedness, his sinfulness was by the death of the lamb and the death of the lamb would cover the shame of their nakedness. 
Notice that the law of sacrifices comes after sin enters the world. The moral law existed before sin came into the world. Is that very clear in the book of Genesis? It's absolutely clear. The moral law before sin, the ceremonial law of sacrifices after sin and because of sin. Now we've noticed this in Genesis chapters 1 through 3, but the question is what about Genesis chapter 4 through Exodus 19? Because in chapter 20 of Exodus you have the Ten Commandments. Well the fact is that the Ten Commandments, God's moral law existed from Genesis chapter 4 through uh, Exodus chapter 19. You say, how do we know that? Let me give you some uh, individuals that actually sinned before the Ten Commandments were written on tables of stone at Mount Sinai. Let me ask you, did Satan sin in heaven? We studied this. It's, the Bible says that he sinned from where? From the beginning. Did Adam sin? Romans chapter 5 and verse 12 says that sin entered the world through one man. Did Cain sin? Yes, God told him that sin was at the gate when he was deliberating whether to kill his brother. Did the race before the flood sin? The Bible says that the wickedness of man was great and every intent of their hearts, of the thought of their hearts, was only evil continually. Did Sodom and Gomorrah sin? Absolutely. Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, and Genesis 18, verse 20 says that Sodom and Gomorrah were great sinners before the Lord. Were the Amorites sinners before the law was given on Mount Sinai? Absolutely. Genesis 15, verse 16 says, the cup of the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Did Joseph know that adultery was wrong? He most certainly did. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 9 Joseph says, how can I do this and commit this great sin against God? Did Abraham know that lying was wrong? He most certainly did. And he lied twice, once in Egypt and also he lied to Abimelech. And also we even find that the Sabbath existed before Mount Sinai. Because in Exodus 16, God rained manna from heaven, and this is before the Ten Commandments were given. So the question is, did the Ten Commandments exist between Genesis 4 and Exodus 19? Absolutely, because there was sin, and sin is what? Sin is transgression of the law. But now let me ask you, did the ceremonial law exist between Genesis chapter 4 and Exodus chapter 19? Absolutely. Let me just mention, first of all, that in Genesis chapter 4, you have the story of Cain and Abel. Did God ask Cain and Abel to offer a sacrifice, yes or no? Absolutely. Notice Genesis chapter 4, and let's read verses 3 through 5. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock, and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Did Abel offer a sacrifice in obedience to God? He most certainly did. Did the ceremonial law exist after Genesis chapter 3? Most certainly. Did Noah offer a sacrifice when he came out of the ark? Yes, you can read it in Genesis chapter 8 and verses 20 and 21. Did Abraham offer sacrifices to the Lord and raise up altars to the Lord? He most certainly did. And we studied the story of the sacrifice of Isaac that pointed forward to the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. In fact, Jesus once said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. John chapter 8 and verse 56. We also are told in Genesis that Isaac offered sacrifices and Jacob also offered sacrifices. So the ceremonial system of offerings and sacrifices existed between uh, Genesis chapter 4 and Exodus chapter 19 before the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments and the ceremonial law both existed before Mount Sinai. 
God's moral law existed before sin. The ceremonial law comes in after sin in order to deal with the sin problem. Now let's do a comparison of the two laws. Let's talk first of all about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are the constitution of God's government. The Ten Commandments are actually a reflection of God's character. They tell us what God is like in his person. And therefore, you cannot change the Ten Commandments. You can't change the Ten Commandments any more than you can change God's character. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is to reveal the distinction between good and evil, between right and wrong. And of course, the Ten Commandments reveal what God is really like. Now let's talk a little bit about the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 22 tells us that God spoke the Ten Commandments directly to the children of Israel. What did I say? God spoke the Ten Commandments directly to the children of Israel. Let's read it in Deuteronomy 5 verse 22. These words, the Lord spoke to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice. And he added no more, and he wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. So to whom did God speak the Ten Commandments? He spoke the Ten Commandments to all your assembly, it says, from the mountain. God spoke the Ten Commandments to the entire encampment of Israel. Another interesting detail about the Ten Commandments is that God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger. Notice Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. Exodus, Exodus 31 and verse 18. It says, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with what? Written with the finger of God. Everything else in the Bible, God spoke to the prophet, and the prophet spoke it or wrote it to the people. But when it came to the Ten Commandments, God wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger, and he spoke them personally to the entire assembly of Israel. Notice also that the Ten Commandments were written on tables of stone. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. Deuteronomy 4 and verse 13. It says here, So he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on what? On two tablets of stone. Where did God write with his own finger the Ten Commandments that he spoke directly to the children of Israel? He wrote them on tablets of stone. Now another interesting detail is where the Ten Commandments were placed in the sanctuary. Deuteronomy chapter 10 verses 1 through 5 tell us that the Ten Commandments were placed inside the Ark of the Covenant. Let's read that passage, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verses 1 through 5. It says here, at that time, the Lord said to me, he's speaking to Moses, hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, because Moses broke the first tables, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And God says, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, and you shall put them where? In the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain having the two tablets in my hand. And now notice, and he, that is God, wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments which the Lord had spoken to you, notice to Israel, in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. And now notice, then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets, where? In the ark which I had made, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. So God spoke them, what? Directly to the people. 
Secondly, he wrote them with his own finger. Third, he wrote them on tablets of what? Of stone. Four, he placed them where? Inside the Ark of the Covenant. And a fifth characteristic is that the Ten Commandments are not burdensome. In other words, the Ten Commandments are not a yoke of bondage like many Christians teach. In fact, notice 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. Here, uh, the beloved disciple John says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not what? They are not burdensome. They are not a heavy burden. By the way, David loved God's law. He did not see the law as being a heavy yoke of bondage. Notice Psalm 119. We're going to read now verse 72, and then verse 131, and finally verse 174. And I'm going to read them in sequence. Notice. The law of your mouth, says David, is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for your commandments. I longed for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Does that sound like the law was a yoke of bondage to David? Absolutely not. He said, I love you, law. How could a Christian say that the law is a yoke of bondage when the law distinguishes right from wrong and good from evil? Now let's talk a little bit about the ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was actually written by Moses. It was not written by God. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 9. Deuteronomy 31, verse 9. It says here, So Moses wrote this law and delivered it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord and to all the elders of Israel. So who wrote the ceremonial law? The Bible says Moses wrote this law. But not only this, Moses also spoke this law to the religious leaders and to the people. Who spoke the Ten Commandments? God spoke the Ten Commandments to all of the congregation. Now notice what it says in Leviticus chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Leviticus 1 verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him. To whom did God speak when he gave the Ten Commandments? To all of the encampment of Israel. To whom does God speak when he gives the ceremonial law? To Moses. It says, Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. See, God uses an intermediary to speak to the people. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd, and of the flock, and then the next several chapters describe the different offerings and sacrifices that were made in the sanctuary or in the temple. Also, I want you to notice that the ceremonial law was actually written in a book. And it was placed beside the Ark of the Covenant, not inside the Ark of the Covenant. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verses 24 through 26. Deuteronomy 31, verses 24 through 26. It says here, So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in what? In a book. Who wrote this law? Moses. Where did he write it? In a book. So it says, So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. Where was the ceremonial law placed? It was put beside the Ark. Where were the Ten Commandments put? They were put inside the Ark. Is there a clear distinction between God's moral law and God's ceremonial law? Absolutely clear according to Scripture. 
Now let's talk a little bit about the law, sin, death, and substitution. The first thing that I want us to notice is that the purpose of the law is to point out sin. Notice Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is what? Is the knowledge of sin. How do you know that an act is sinful? Because the law of God tells you that it is sinful. For example, how do you know that it's wrong for you to have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife? Because there's a commandment that says you shall not what? Commit adultery. How do you know that lying is wrong? Because there's a commandment that says thou shalt not bear what? False witness. In other words, the purpose of the law, the Ten Commandments, is to point out sin. And the question is, what is sin? The Bible defines what sin is. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is what? Lawlessness. Or as the King James Version has it, sin is what? The transgression of the law. So the law points out sin, and sin is the transgression of God's moral law. And what is the consequence of sin, according to Scripture? Notice Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The first part of the verse says, For the wages of sin is what? Is death. So notice, the law points out sin. Sin is transgression of the law. And transgression of the law leads to what? To death. How many of us have sinned? You know, if anybody here said that you haven't sinned, that would be your first sin, because you're lying. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And Romans 3 verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So have we all transgressed God's law? Absolutely. And therefore, all of us deserve what? deserve death. Now the question is, must we all die? Absolutely not. Why? Because what the law demands, Jesus provided. And the penalty which the law of God demands, Jesus paid. So if I receive Jesus as my Savior in repentance and in confession, and I trust in Him, then His death saves me from the penalty of death. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Here is the remedy for sin. The ceremonial law has to do with the remedy for sin. It comes in after sin because sin put us all on death row. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For he, that is God the Father, for he made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, see Jesus knew no sin, but the Father made him what? Made him to be sin for us. In other words, God took our sins and placed them on whom? On Jesus. Now notice the last part of the verse. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our unrighteousness so that we could have his perfect righteousness. That's what the ceremonial law pointed to. Now we need to ask a very important question. What is it that saves human beings from the sentence of death? It is what? The life of Jesus and his death on the cross, right? But now here comes a very important question. How were Old Testament saints saved before Jesus Christ came? Has anybody ever asked that question? How were people in the Old Testament saved when Jesus had not yet come to pay the debt of sin by his death on the cross? Well, let's use a hypothetical situation. Let's suppose that someone in the encampment of Israel decided to steal his neighbor, neighbor's sandals. Is that a violation of the moral law? Yes. 
the moral law says thou shalt not what? Steal. And if you steal, the wages of stealing is what? The wages of stealing or violating the moral law is death. And so that person, by stealing the sandals of his neighbor, had placed himself on death row. Of course, the question is, is there any way that that sinner could escape the death sentence and still live in spite of his sin? The answer is absolutely yes. If you read Leviticus chapter 1, and we're not going to go there, you can read it at your le leisure. Leviticus chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4, and actually the first seven chapters have different types of sacrifices. You'll find that the sinner could bring an immaculate, spotless lamb to the sanctuary. And he could place his hand on the head of that lamb and confess his sin on the head of the lamb, that sin of stealing his neighbor's sandals. In other words, by confessing his sin on the head, and notice it's the head, very, very important. Where did Jesus bear our sins? He bore our sins on his conscience, which has to do with his mind, with his brain. And so the sin was actually being transferred from the sinner to the perfect victim. And then after the sin was transferred to the victim, the sinner himself had to take the knife and he had to slay that animal. In other words, the animal was suffering death in place of whom? In place of the sinner. In other words, the animal was, pun was punished so that the sinner would not have to be punished. Now, it's interesting to notice that this ritual actually did not legally take care of the problem of sin. The moral law pointed out sin and its penalty, and the ceremonial law provided the remedy for the problem, but the Old Testament system legally did not actually remove sin. And you say, how is that? Let's read Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4. Here, the Apostle Paul is categorical when he says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could what? Could take away sin. So did these sacrifices actually legally take away sin? Absolutely not. Because sin cannot be removed by animals dying the creator himself had to come and give his life in place of his creatures. You say, what was the purpose of this whole system of sacrifices then? Let me put it this way. The entire Old Testament system was actually a system of IOUs. When the sinner came to the sanctuary, confessed his sin on the head of the animal, and then slew the animal... At that moment, Jesus said, This sinner came in penitence to me. I will pay. In other words, the sentence of the sinner was commuted because Jesus Christ had promised that in the future, he was going to what? He was going to come to pay for that sin. In other words, the sinner in the Old Testament saw in the sacrifice a symbol of Christ and was still saved by the Christ who was to come. But sin was not legally taken care of until Jesus died on the cross. In other words, what happened was that the sentence was postponed or deferred on the basis of the promise that Jesus made that he was going to come to pay all of those IOUs of the Old Testament system. The Old Testament system, in other words, was a system of debt. It was a credit system, which means that the sanctuary in the Old Testament was filled with sin because the, the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. Now go with me to Colossians chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14, which is referring to this. Colossians chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14. It says here, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. The handwriting of ordinances was what? Against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way. What did he take out of the way? The handwriting of requirements or ordinances. It says he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to what? To the cross. What did he nail to the cross? The King James Version, the New King James, says the handwriting of requirements. That is not the best translation. You know, in recent years, it's been discovered that really the, the Greek word cheirographon, which translates handwriting of ordinances, actually is referring to a bond of debt. I'm going to read the definition that is given by one lexicon. The cheirographon, or the uh, handwriting of requirements that's mentioned here, is a certificate of indebtedness personally prepared and signed by the debtor. Now let me read you some translations from other versions of the Bible. The New American Standard Bible says that it means a certificate of debt. The New Living Translation says that it refers to a record of the charges against us. The English Standard Version says canceling the record of our debt. The message translates that old arrest warrant canceled. The New Century Version translates, he canceled the debt. The New English Translation translates, a certificate of indebtedness. The Revised Standard Version translates, having canceled the bond that stood against us. And the New Revised Standard Version says, erasing the record that stood against us. What is it that Jesus Christ nailed to the cross of Calvary? He nailed to the cross of Calvary all of the IOUs that had been signed by the debtors who offered these animal sacrifices in the Old Testament system. In other words, every time that a sinner offered a sacrifice and saw in that sacrifice a symbol of Jesus Christ, he was looking at the future, at the coming of the Messiah, who said, I will pay for all of those IOUs. I will pay all of those unpaid bills that have come up. Now when Jesus came, the debt of sin had accumulated to an alarming rate. And the debt had not been legally paid because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. In fact, between Sinai and Calvary, over one million sacrifices were offered just in the morning and evening sacrifice. God simply accepted the faith of the person who brought the animal and confessed his sin and killed the animal, and Jesus said, someday I will come and I will pay. And so when Jesus came, he nailed our debt to where? To the cross. He didn't nail the Ten Commandments to the cross. He nailed our bond of debt to the cross. He took care of it once and for all, legally, because now he offered his own precious blood. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Now let's go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. As a result of what Jesus did on the cross, he now can brag a little bit. <laughs> and he can actually expose Satan and his angels because Satan had said, you can't forgive sinners because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. But when Jesus nailed our IOUs to the cross of Calvary, now Jesus says something to the principalities and powers. Notice Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a what? A public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. That is in his what? In his cross. Let me give you a biblical example so you can understand what this means. In Jude 9, we have the story of the death of Moses and something that happened after Moses died. There are two strange things about the death of Moses. Number one, 
The Bible says that God buried him. The only person that I know of in the Bible that God buried. And secondly, the Bible says that nobody knew where his tomb was, which is very unusual because the Jews marked the tombs of their heroes. And then later on, during the ministry of Christ, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses appears talking to Jesus Christ on the Mount. So what must have happened after Moses died? He must have been what? He must have been resurrected. In fact, notice Jude 9, where we have a reference to this event. It says, Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about what? Oh, Michael was disputing with the devil over what? The body of Moses. Do you think God fights over dead bodies, over corpses? What had Michael come to do? He had come to do what he will do when he comes again. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the what? Of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And so it says, he dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. You know, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, he did not resurrect by himself. There was a multitude that resurrected with him. Now he could resurrect them because all of their IOUs had been what? Taken care of by Jesus Christ. Let's read about that in Matthew 27 and verses 50 and 51. Matthew 27, 50 and 51. It says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, this isn't during the Old Testament period, who had fallen asleep were what? Were raised. They, they didn't come out on Friday. They came out on, on Resurrection Day because it continues saying here, and coming out of the graves, when? After his resurrection, they went out into the holy city and appeared to many. And if I had time, I would show you that the first fruit celebration, which represents the resurrection of Christ, that very day that Jesus resurrected, he went to the presence of his father, and he said, Father, I have offered the sacrifice for sin is my sacrifice accepted? And the father said, yes. And then Jesus took a trip back to the earth. Forty days later, Jesus is ascending to heaven again, but now he's not ascending by himself. Who's ascending with him? All of those that came out of the graves that witnessed in favor of his resurrection now go to heaven, and they are the first fruits of the great harvest they will come forth from the tomb when Jesus Christ returns in power and glory. Now let me read you this statement from Ellen White. It's found in Signs of the Times, April 22, 1880. Some people think that people in the Old Testament were saved by the law, that there was no grace in the Old Testament. Listen to what she has to say. Many regard the Jewish economy as an age of darkness. They have received the erroneous idea that repentance and faith had no part in the Hebrew religion, which they claim consisted only of forms and ceremonies. But the children of Israel were saved by Christ as virtually as is the sinner of today. By faith, they saw Christ in those types and shadows which pointed forward to his first advent and death, when type should meet anti-type. They rejoiced in a Savior to come, typified by sacrificial offerings, while we rejoice in a Savior who has come. That which was expectation to ancient Israel is certainty to modern Israel. The world's Redeemer was in close connection with his people then, being enshrouded in that cloudy pillar. Let us not say then that they had not Christ in the Jewish age. How were people saved in the Old Testament? They were saved by Jesus Christ. The sacrifices did not save them. They pointed forward to the Savior who would legally pay for sin. Every time they sacrificed an animal, it was an IOU. And Jesus said, don't worry, I will pay the IOU. It was a gigantic credit system. 
And when Jesus came, he took all of the IOUs, the bond of death, and he nailed the bond of death to the cross. And all of those individuals who had died in faith were actually legally saved at that moment from their sins because of the death of Jesus Christ. You know, this whole system of IOUs came to an end when Jesus died on the cross. Let's notice Hebrews chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. Hebrews chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. It says here, For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment. The commandment is dealing with the commandment of the priesthood, if you read the context, because of its weakness and unprofitableness. And then it continues saying, For the law, and if you read the context, it's talking about the ceremonial law, for the law made nothing perfect. In other words, it did not finally resolve the issue of sin. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a what? Of a better hope through which we draw near to God. What is the better hope? The hope that is brought by whom? By Jesus Christ. Notice also Hebrews 8 and verse 13. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13. It says here, in that he says, a new covenant, he has made the first, what? Obsolete. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to what? Is ready to vanish away. And if you read the context, it's talking about the ceremonial system that was going to come to an end when Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. This whole priestly system of offerings and sacrifices and washings, etc., pointed forward to Jesus. And when Jesus came, all of this that is called unprofitable was nailed to the cross, was taken away, and it was no longer necessary to celebrate the rites and ceremonies. Now we're ready to understand Colossians 2, 16 and 17. This text is greatly misused by Christians. They try to use it to prove that we can eat or drink anything we want. They try to use it to prove that we don't have to keep the seventh-day Sabbath anymore. But let's notice what this passage is really teaching. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16. So, because he's nailed all of the IOUs to the cross, that's the context, we read chapter 2 and verse 15. So let no one judge you in food or drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of whom? The substance is of Christ. Now I want to read you a statement that we find in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 365. Notice what Ellen White has to say about this Old Testament system and what Christians, many Christians, teach about the Old Testament system. She says there are many who try to blend these two systems, using the texts that speak of the ceremonial law to prove that the moral law has been abolished. But this is a perversion of the scriptures. The distinction between the two systems is broad and clear, and we've noticed that tonight. The ceremonial system was made up of symbols pointing to Christ, to his sacrifice and his priesthood. This ritual law, with its sacrifices and ordinances, was to be performed by the Hebrews until type met anti-type in the death of Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Then, all the sacrificial offerings were to cease, it is this law that Christ took out of the way, nailing to his cross. Now the question is, what is this nobody judge you in food or in drink? You know, some people take that to say that you can eat anything you want. The fact is that food and drink here has nothing whatsoever to do with the food that you put on your table. You see, with the sacrifices in the Old Testament, there were food and drink offerings. Let's read one example, and there are many. Exodus 29 and verses 38 through 41. Exodus 29, 38 through 41. This is referring to foods and drinks that were offered with the sacrifices. It has nothing to do with the food that we eat on our from our tables. It says, now this is what you shall offer on the altar, two lambs of the first year, day by day continually, 
One lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. With the one lamb shall be one-tenth of an ephah of flour. See, there's, there's a food, food offering. Mixed with one-fourth of a hin of pressed what? Oil, that's food also. And one-fourth of a hin of what? Wine as a what? Drink offering. See? And then it says in verse 41, And the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. And you shall offer it with the grain offering, see, there's, the, there's the food, and the drink offering, as in the morning, for a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. So what is referred to when you have foods and drinks here? Is it talking about, uh, you know, whether we can eat pork or not, or whether we can eat lobster or not, or whether we can eat shrimp or not? It has nothing to do with common, ordinary food. It has to do with the food and drink offerings that were presented in conjunction with the sacrificial system. Now, I want you to notice Hebrews 9, where this idea is picked up. Hebrews 9 and verses 9 through 12. Speaking about the Old Testament system, it says it was symbolic for the present time, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. In other words, those sacrifices of the Old Testament could not, uh, could not really give the people a consciousness. My sin has been definitely taken care of because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Notice verse 10. This system was concerned only with what? Foods and drinks. The same expression that we found in Colossians chapter 2. So is this talking about the food we put on our table? No, it's talking about the law of sacrifices and offerings. So it says concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances, now listen carefully, imposed until the time of Reformation. Until when did you have these foods and drinks and washings and sacrifices? Until the time of Reformation. The question is, when is the time of Reformation? Notice the next verse. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of bulls and calves, but with his own what? With his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So what did the foods and drinks have to do with? They were related to the ceremonial law. Notice Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 1 through 4. The same idea comes through. Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4. It says, for the law, and the context shows us the ceremonial law. We'll see that in a minute. For the law having a shadow of good things to come. What are those good things to come? Jesus Christ, that's right. And not the very image of the things can never, with these same sacrifices, see, this is the law of sacrifices, right? With these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. That, that does, it's not talking about moral perfection. It's talking about them saying, my sin has been taken care of once and for all. Verse 2, for then, would they not have ceased to be offered? If those sacrifices took care of sin, why continue offering them? Day after day, year after year. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away what? Could take away sin. Are you understanding what the foods and drinks are? Now let's talk about the festivals. Nobody judge you about the festivals or the feasts. In a book that has been published recently by my friend Ron Dupre, it's called Judging the Sabbath, he has done an interesting study of this word feasts that is used in Colossians chapter 2, the, the King James Version says holy day, but really it's the word feast. What he's shown in this book is that the word chag, which is translated here uh, in the Old Testament festival, here it's the Greek word heorte, refers not to all of the Hebrew feasts, but it refers particularly to the feasts where people had to go to Jerusalem to mandatory mandatorily be there for those feasts. What were those feasts? Passover and unleavened bread, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Every male, 12 years and older, had to go to Jerusalem to be there for those feasts. Interestingly enough, the word Chag in the Old Testament 
which is translated feast in the Old Testament. And the Greek word heorte, which is the exact equivalent in the Greek language, refer exclusively to these pilgrimage festivals. They do not refer to the other feasts. You know, because you had the Feast of Trumpets, and you had the, you had the Day of Atonement, and you had also the Jubilee, and you had the sabbatical year. Interestingly enough, all of those other uh, days are called by the word Sabbaths. They were ceremonial Sabbaths. And so some people argue, they say, well, Pastor Bohr, it says nobody judge you with feasts or with Sabbaths. You're saying that, uh, you're saying that the feasts are the seven yearly feasts. Isn't that the same as the Sabbaths, the ceremonial Sabbaths? They're not the same. Because the word kag in the Old Testament and the word heorte in the New Testament refers only to the pilgrimage festivals. Whereas the Sabbaths refer to things like the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, which was a day of rest, the sabbatical year every seven years, and the Jubilee year, which took place every 50 years. And so basically, what the Apostle Paul is speaking about when he says, let no one judge you in food or in drink, there's the food and drinks that are offered with the sacrifices, let no one judge you regarding a holy day, it's these pilgrimage feasts. And then he continues saying, let no one judge you concerning the new moons. What is this issue of the new moons? Well, in the Hebrew religious year, you had seven months of the religious year. The first month was around our time of Easter, around March and April. And the seventh month was around the month of September or October. And the new moon marked the beginning of each month. Now, do we have seven months today that we celebrate? No, we don't celebrate the seven months and the Jewish festivals, right? Because they all pointed towards what? They all pointed toward Jesus Christ. So are we to celebrate the new moons that mark the beginning of those months? Absolutely not. Notice Numbers chapter 28 and verses 11 through 19 where you have the new moons spoken of. It says, at the beginning of your months, could be translated new moon, you shall present a burnt offering to the Lord, two young bulls, one ram, and seven lambs in their first year without blemish, three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil for each bull, two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil for one for the one ram, and one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering for each lamb, as a burnt offering of sweet aroma, and so on. And then it goes on to speak about the month. The word month here really uh, is translated in the King James Version, new moons. So the new moons were also connected with the seven months of the Hebrew religious year, which they observed, but which we don't have to observe because they were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now what about the Sabbaths that are mentioned here in Colossians chapter 2? Is this talking about the seventh day Sabbath? Nobody can judge me if I don't keep the Sabbath? Of course not. You see, it says in Colossians chapter 2 that these things were shadows of things to come. Is the Sabbath a shadow of things to come? Is the seventh day Sabbath a shadow of things to come? Absolutely not. The Sabbath was made before sin. And the Sabbath does not point forward. The Sabbath points what? Backwards. It's a memorial of creation. And so these Sabbaths cannot be the Seventh-day Sabbath because the Seventh-day Sabbath were not shadows of anything to come. They pointed backward to what God did at the time of creation. Now let's cover one final thing before we bring this to an end. Leviticus chapter 23 makes a clear distinction between the ceremonial Sabbath and the seventh day Sabbath. Notice Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 3. After verse 2, God has said, these are my feasts that you shall celebrate. And then there are seven of them mentioned. Notice that he places the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath apart. It says here, Six days shall work be done, 
But the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And then after mentioning the seven celebrations in chapter 23 of Leviticus, we find at the end of the chapter, in verses 37 and 38, I want you to notice there's a distinction between the ceremonial Sabbath and the seventh-day Sabbath. It says there in verse 37, These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer, or to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything on its day. And now notice verse 38. All of these offerings are what? Besides the Sabbaths of the Lord. Besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord. So are all of these celebrations besides the Sabbath of the Lord? Absolutely. The Sabbath of the Lord stands apart. It is actually a memorial of creation. And so Colossians chapter 2, verse 17 ends by saying, all of these things were shadows of things to come. But the body or the substance is of whom? Of Christ. So basically, this is the idea. Jesus was standing here and he was projecting a shadow into the Old Testament period. And as people looked at the shadow, where was their attention directed to? As they looked at the shadow, when you see a shadow, what do you do? You want to see what the reality is that projects the shadow. So in all of these ceremonies, the Jews uh, looked at these shadowy uh, celebrations and offerings and sacrifices, and that was to lead them to look at what? At the reality or the body that was projecting that shadow. In other words, the whole system was centered in Jesus Christ. They were not saved by the law. They were saved by grace just like we are today.